So it's work in progress, there's more to be done, but rebalancing our economy is absolutely crucial to our national success. Sorry, long answer, but important question. Um, lady right up here. into the kind of nasty party rhetoric that comes out of the Labour Party. But over the last Parliament, I've been pushed towards Labour, and I think I will be voting Labour at the next election. One of the key things that swung me was the legal aid cuts that your government have brought in, which mean that now access to justice is basically a preserve of the rich. And I think that this is basically a disgrace and that justice should be accessible to all, including the poorest in our country. What would you do about that in the next okay. Parliament? All right, well, I, I, thank you for being so frank with me. I'll try and be frank with you. We had to make difficult spending decisions, right? We, had, we got that note in 2010, the one that said there's no money left, and that was true. Our budget deficit in Britain was forecast to be higher than the budget deficit in Greece. We were borrowing over 10% of our national income. I was worried that we were on the brink. I was worried no one would lend Britain any money anymore. I was worried we might have to call in the IMF. I was genuinely worried what we had to do to get back on track. So we had to make some cuts. And I thought the right thing to do is to safeguard some of the most important budgets. So the NHS, we said we will not cut the NHS, we'll expand it every year, and we have stuck to that. And as a result, the NHS is expanding. But legal aid, we said, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to make some reductions in this budget. If you look at per head of the population, what we spend on legal aid, and you compare us to other common law countries, like New Zealand, like Australia, you'll find we are still spending more per head of the population than they are. So, but I accept it has led to some difficult uh, decisions. We've tried to protect important areas, like, for instance, domestic violence, to make sure there's always proper legal representation there. But there's no doubt it has led to difficulties and it has led to some need for efficiencies. But we have, you know, to govern is to choose. And we chose the health service uh, first as the most important service to provide. I'm sure there's more we can do to improve access uh, to justice, to make sure our criminal justice system and civil justice systems work better. I think there's still quite a lot of duplication and inefficiency in the system, but we took some difficult decisions, and I'll be absolutely frank with you, that was one of them. Before you vote Labour, I would just ask them, what are the difficult decisions you're going to take? Are you going to restore those cuts in legal aid? I haven't heard that from uh, Ed Balls. I don't think they are. And crucially, I would ask them this. How are you going to pay for this if you don't have a strong economy? All these things we want, a strong justice system, a strong health system, a strong education system, they need a strong economy. You know, businesses like this that have invested masses in Britain, why does O2 come to Britain? We've got a great telecoms market, yes. We've got brilliantly skilled people, yes. Yorkshire's a great place to run a business, yes. But they've also come here because this is a business-friendly government that's cut business taxes, that's built motorways and railways and said, let's make Britain a great place to invest. What I hear from Labour is anti-business, anti-enterprise, and I worry the businesses will push off, the tax take will go down, and there won't be any money for legal aid or the health service. But anyway, that's the end of the party political broadcast. Um, <laughs> gentlemen up here. Okay, well, I have to use some figures, but I think you're asking an absolutely brilliant question. I think the truth about the NHS is this. Look, we are a growing population. We're an aging population. We've got more people uh, surviving childbirth with rare conditions. We've got more people living longer with multiple conditions. So people who've got problems with obesity and diabetes and uh, strokes and uh, blood pressure, all, you know, so the pressures on the system are massive. And I think the truth about the health service is this. We've put more money in. It is treating more patients, sorry, a figure for you, six million more patients. It's carrying out a million more operations, but the pressures on the system are very great. So as well as putting in the money, we've got to make the system work better. And here's where I think uh, that we're struggling at the moment. We need to make sure that as well as putting money into our hospitals, our primary care system, the GPs, that system is working as well as it possibly could. And I think at the moment, it isn't, and that's why one of the big reforms we want in the next parliament is to make sure you have seven-day access to your GP. 
This works now for about 8 million people in our country. So GP surgeries open seven days a week, eight in the morning till eight in the evening. I think we want that for the whole of the country because then many more people will know they can get to see their GP, they can get a, you know, a, a, an update on their condition without having to go into A&E, without having to go to the main hospital. So I think that is priority number one. I think priority number two is making sure the social care system, which is delivered by local councils, that that works better with the NHS. Because at the moment, we've got too many people stuck in hospital beds who could be treated back in the community or back at home, but there aren't the resources to help make that happen. So we've set up this new fund, the Better Care Fund, which is health and social services money. So, for instance, Leeds City Council will be able to spend that money with the local health operators to get people out of hospital. Never believe a politician who tells you everything in the NHS is perfect and it's all going to be even more perfect in the future. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying we made a decision, we put the money in, it is expanded in terms of what it's doing. It's a brilliant national institution. It's got some really world-beating skills. There are some problems and issues, but I think if we're sensible about it, we can deal with them. A few figures for you, but not too many. I hope that was all right. Okay, um, lady down here. Yes. 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 Okay. Good question. What can we do about helping families around a mixture of childcare, school hours, term hours? I think it's a, I mean, how long have we got? This is a very big, big question. I mean, first of all, I want us to be a really family friendly country. I mean, I start from a very simple principle. You know, who is it who, before we even get to the NHS, brings up our children, cares for the sick, looks after the elderly, makes us happy when we're sad. It's the family. It's the most important institution we've got in our country. So we should do more to try and help families do what they do. Now, coming directly to your question about schools, some people say to me, come on, Prime Minister, stop being such a Grinch. Let us take our children out of school in term time to take them on holiday so we can go on a cheaper holiday. And I really hate having to say this, but the answer is no, we shouldn't do that. All the evidence is that attendance at school is so important for our children's future that I think it's right we have a system where you can only get that time out with a special reason. But what we can do and what we are doing is saying to schools, almost all of whom now are academies, they're now self-governing schools, they set their own date. They can set different dates for term times. If they want to change the dates, if they want to change half term, you know, let's do that so then you can access... You know, because I know what it's like, booking EasyJet as soon as it hits the school holidays, the prices go up like that. And so let's try and be a bit smarter and have holidays set at different times. So I think that would help. Next thing is, these new schools, the academies, the free schools that are being set up, if they want to change the hours of the day, they can do that too. Some of the new free schools, these are state schools set up within the state sector, some of them have chosen to be open 50 weeks a year, providing childcare when they're not being schools and actually working from 8 in the morning till 7 at night. I went to visit one in Norwich, fantastically popular, people commuting into the city, taking their children, working a full day, knowing they're being looked after and cared for, and taking them home in the evening. So let's have more flexibility, let's have more creativity, but also let's help all schools that want to run the breakfast clubs, run the after-school clubs as well. Added to that, sorry, long answer, but one of the things we announced in our manifesto is doubling the supported hours of nursery care from 15 hours to 30 hours for parents of three and four-year-olds, because I think that's a crucial period when your children are beginning to get school ready, where it would really help to have that extra childcare. I want more families sitting around the table to be able to say, right, I'd like to work some more hours, or I'd like to go back to work, and I want the choice. Too many people make that calculation and think, well, I can't afford, I'd like to go back to work, but I can't afford to. So we've got to make it more affordable. That is good for the families, and frankly, it's good for our economy. It's probably good for businesses like O2 as well. So I think that's the package of things we should do to make Britain a more family-friendly country. Final question. Let's have the gentleman here. Uh, Cameron, Hold on, we've got a microphone for you, just Sorry. in case. You can, you can serenade us. Okay. <laughs> During the um, Scottish, uh, Scottish referendum, um, the parties were all caught out by the sort of surge in the, in the willingness of people in Scotland to leave the Union. Um, 
and there was a bit of a panic, wasn't there? So, why? Well, why? Yeah. <laughs> it was a nervous moment. Certainly how I put it, but, that, uh, from, a, yeah. from a bystander's point of view, yeah. it certainly seemed that way. Um, if you win the next election, you promised um, Britain a, a referendum on leaving the European Union, um, and I'm just wondering what sort of plans you've got uh, to mitigate against us. Okay. against the risks of us actually leaving the Union? Good, good question. But first of all, you know, why, why did we have a referendum on Scotland and the United Kingdom? I, look, I'm a great believer that you've got to confront the big issues in politics and not duck them. And the fact is, the Scottish Parliament elected a Scottish National Party government saying they wanted a referendum. And I had a choice as Prime Minister. I could either say, no, forget it, you're not having one, which I think would have been disastrous. I think that would have been a moment when our country really fractured and the Scottish National Party government probably would have held their own sort of illegal kind of, you know, uh, referendum. That would have been, so I think, let's do the honest thing, the straightforward thing, have that referendum, have the debate. Yes, I wouldn't call it a panic, sir. There were some nervous moments. I was passionate about keeping our country together and I'm delighted they voted to stay. We've now got this very interesting situation. I've just been in Glasgow this morning where it does look like there's something of a tidal wave of the Scottish National Party taking over from Labour in many of those seats and I do fear that if we're not careful in the United Kingdom we're going to have a Labour government backed by the SNP with a whole lot of demands for even more borrowing, even more spending, even more taxes which would be disastrous for our country and you know I'll take the opportunity while I'm here to say the best way to stop that is voting for me on May the 7th but, but <laughs> I, I, I'm digressing. On Europe Again, we shouldn't duck this question. The fact is, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in our country about whether we want to stay in this organisation and whether it works for us. My view is, there are parts of the European Union that do work for us. We want to be in there for trade and cooperation. We're a trading nation. Businesses like O2 want to be able to sell and market and trade uh, around Europe. So let's keep those things. But frankly, you know, we've had a succession of treaties that have passed powers from Britain to Brussels, and the British people have not been asked about it. And there are things in the European Union I think that people do find frustrating. We've got the single currency that is clearly causing a lot of damage to the European economy. We're not part of it. But there's a danger that the single currency will rather take over the European Union, and those countries outside it, like us, won't get a proper say. So my argument is simple. Let's get stuck in there, let's negotiate a better deal, and then we put that to the British people and say, here's the choice. Not staying in the current organisation or leaving, staying in on a renewed, changed basis or leaving. And I think that's the right thing to do. The worst thing to do is have no strategy at all. Britain just sort of drift towards the exit because the politicians didn't want to take on the issue and get the best deal for our country. And I'm quite convinced that it's right to ask the British people. In the end, you can't hold Britain in an organisation against the will of the British people. So I think, have a renegotiation, get a better deal, put the deal to the British people, they're sovereign, they will decide. That's the plan, that's the strategy. And as for the other parties, you have to ask them what their strategy is, but I don't see much. I think they don't want to talk about this because they haven't got a plan. In politics, final word. Having a plan is what matters. We've got a plan for the economy to keep getting the country back to work and turn it around. We've got a plan to keep our United Kingdom together, and we've got a plan to get a better deal in Europe. That, I think, is crucial, and that's why I hope in 21 days' time you'll give me another five years. Please vote, whatever way you do vote. Don't uh, sit on the sidelines. It's a very precious thing, having that right to choose your government, or if you want, kick your government out. It's a great thing we got in this country. Please use it wisely. Think about it. I hope that you'll say we're on the right track. Let's give it another five years. Let's really turn this economy around. And let's make sure there are many great businesses in our country, like O2, who've been fantastic hosts to me today. Thank you very much. Thank you.